Chapter Five of Wilderness: A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: Waiting. Thursday, November Fourteenth. We're ready to go to Seward the moment the weather moderates, which may be not for two weeks or two months. I've packed blankets and several days' food in a great knapsack, so that if we're driven to land somewhere, will not perish of hunger. And this trip, while it may be carried out speedily, may, on the other hand, strand us days without number in Seward, and cost three or four times that many dollars. The wind is still in the north, the days are wonderfully beautiful, and the nights no less. This very night Rockwell and I skated for the third time. Ah, but it was glorious on the lake! the moon high above us in a cloudless sky, the snow and ice on the mountain sides glistening, and the spruces black. We skated together hand in hand like sweethearts, going far to one end of the lake in the teeth of the wind, and returning before it like full-rigged ships. And Rockwell, whose second skate to-day this was, improves every minute. I've cut Rockwell's hair, four months' growth, he has had the appearance of a boy of the Middle Ages, with his hair cut to a line above his eyes. Now he's truly a handsome fellow, and such a man under the hardships of this cold place and rough life that I'm very proud of him. Saturday, November 16th. Still it blows, yesterday and today, cold, clear, and blue, and the moon these nights stands straight above us and stays till dawn setting far in the north. It is really cold. Olson is quite miserable and wonders how we can keep at our wood-cutting and skating. But I think I shall never live in such cold again as in that first winter on Monhegan, in my unfinished house, when on cold days the water-pails four feet from the stove froze over between the times I used them, and my beans at soak froze one night on the lighted stove. We love this weather here. While the cabin is draughty, I pile on fuel remorselessly, and that's a real delight after having all my life had truly to count the pieces of coal and wood. The ice on the pond is six inches thick, part of it clear black, that one can see the bottom through. This morning Rockwell changed to heavy underwear. He complains always of the heat, day and night. The days go on about as usual, varied only by an occasional weekly or monthly chore, and success or failure in my painting. This morning, with Olson's help, I brought my boat up on to the land above the beach. The boat is an extremely heavily built eighteen-foot dory, with a heavy keel, and yet the wind carried it four feet last night, and if it had not been secured, might have blown it down into the water where the waves would soon have wrecked it. This night I shall not read in bed. It is quite too far away from the stove. Sunday, November 17th. We jumped from bed in a hurry this morning, believing that the apparent stillness boded a calm day and a fit one for the Seward trip. But the sea beyond our cove was running swiftly and within two hours there was a gale of wind and some snow. Cold it was, and dark. We'd hardly put the lamp out after breakfast before we lighted it again for late dinner. Still in that short daylight I painted, and Rockwell skated and painted, and we both cut a lot of wood. I've spent the evening writing, trying an article for the modern school. We turned my boat over and secured it to the ground with ropes, just in time to escape the fall of snow to-night that lies deep on the ground. The moon is up, and through the clouds there comes a general illumination like daylight. Monday, November 18th. Today a storm from the southeast. It blows like fury. Breakfast by lamplight, work until dark, then dinner. In the neighborhood of three o'clock, or maybe four, more work and a nap, for I felt exhausted. Rockwell goes to bed and is read to. I work a while longer, then a light supper for which Rockwell gets up again, 
then the dishes washed and are again in bed a call on olson for three quarters of an hour leaving there at ten to work again till some wild hour what a strangely arranged day i'm determined to have a clock but now it will be seen that no more time must be spent this night upon this diary amen tuesday november nineteenth a dreary dreary a weary day but i've worked or somehow been ceaselessly busy and now i'm about ready for my nightcap of reading and bed four canvases stretched and primed stand to my credit and that alone is one day's work in effort and conquered repugnance what a tedious work my christmas letters are written nearly all of them and as christmas draws near it seems more and more impossible without home and the children it will be a huge make-believe for one of our family here there's a big storm at sea from the look of the water and the sound of the wind and the rain falls drearily and on the roof it rattles from the tall trees the great drops fall like stones they beat to pieces little by little the paper roof and now when the rain is hardest we hear the drip drip of the water on the floor but we are comfortable so what of it all i read big claws and little claws to rockwell tonight that's a great story and we roared over it rockwell doesn't like the stories about kings and queens he says they're always marrying and that kind of stuff just the same rockwell himself has his life and marriage pretty closely planned the journey from the east alone the wife to be found at seattle to save her car fare and yet not put off as far as alaska for there they don't look nice enough and then life in alaska to the end of his days and i'm to be along if i'm not dead as i probably shall be he says i have just finished the life of blake and am now reading blake's prose catalogue etc and a book of indian essays of kumaraswamy the intense and illuminating fervor of blake i have just read this quote, the human mind cannot go beyond the gift of god the holy ghost to suppose that art can go beyond the finest specimens of art that are now in the world is not knowing what art is it is being blind to the gifts of the spirit End quote. here in the supreme simplicity of life amid these mountains the spirit laughs at man's concern with the form of art with new expression because the old is outworn it is man's own poverty of vision yielding him nothing so that to save himself he must trick out in new garb the old old commonplaces or exalt to be material for art the hitherto discarded trivialities of the mind wednesday november twentieth to-morrow we hope to get off although it still storms there's a terrific sea running but even such a sea would trouble us less than the chop of the north wind the wind above all else is to be feared here i painted little it was so dark somehow on these short days it is difficult to accomplish much certain things have to be done by daylight the chopping of wood carrying of water from a hundred yards away lamp filling and some cooking i made myself a lot of envelopes to-day and second coated the canvases of yesterday stretching and now it is bedtime for to-morrow we rise early oh the porcupine returned to-day and was discovered feeding calmly near the cabin he showed no alarm at rockwell's approach and when finally after some hours of undisturbed nibbling and napping rockwell carried him home by his tail and set him down a little distance from his old cage he ran straight there and interned himself friday november twenty second both yesterday and to-day are to be recorded the porcupine is dead and yesterday he endeared himself so to us playing about in the house with the utmost content the cause of his death we cannot know unless it was our kindness rockwell with olson's leather mittens on did carry him about a good deal of course they are creatures nocturnal and we had planned to let him have his regular hours for exercise and feeding rockwell delighting in the plan that he should stay with him in the woods at night 
which I was certainly going to let him try. But it's over, and pet number two has gone to his happy hunting grounds. It storms, yesterday violently with such wind and rain as seemed incredible. The thin paper roof made the noise deafening so that I could not sleep, and the surf beat and the forest roared. It was a wild night. Today is better, though it pours every half hour. When, when shall we get to Seward? And here before me are displayed all the pretty Christmas presents I have made, and that Rockwell has made. Here we sit, these dark short days, working together at the same table, just like two professional craftsmen. On these days I cannot paint, and Olson calls upon us more than he should. Still we let him sit here in silence, and he is wise enough to be quite content. Now it is late. The stove is out, and I must go to bed. Two meals only to-day. Another is due me. Oh, I made myself a beautiful die for note-paper yesterday, and printed it on my envelopes to-day. Saturday, November 23rd. It dawned calm, with rain hanging in the air. We hurried with our breakfast in the hope that we should get off, but within an hour at the turn of the tide the northwest wind whipped down from the mountains, and the rain fell in torrents. And now at a late hour of the night it still rains, although the wind has fallen. We felled a tree to-day and partly cut it up. Although it was dismally dark all the time, I managed to paint a little. And I wrote much and drew in black and white. Rockwell has been industrious as usual, drawing at my side. He told me an amusing anecdote of little Kathleen that is worthy to go down here. When in play she wants to change her doll's name, she sends for the pretend doctor, again herself, and he operates on the doll. Cutting a hole in her stomach, he stuffs into it a little piece of paper on which he has written a new name. And so the name is changed. Tried some cottonseed oil of Olson's to-day that was too bad. A year or two ago he was given a case of spoiled mayonnaise dressing for fox food. Olson saved the oil which had separated from the rest of it. I made dough for doughnuts while I heated the oil to fry ourselves that great treat. Then arose a pinching, rancid odor that almost made me ill, but which Rockwell called delicious. However, I baked the doughnuts. Still, the oil unheated seemed not bad. Sunday, November 24th. Olson declares this day to be Sunday, and in honor of the day he gave me a cup of milk for junket. And in honor of the day, whatever it is, I worked so hard that now I'm tired out. The day began with snow, and continued with it. It blustered and blew much as a day in March, and the bay looked wild. And now to-night it is clear and starlight. Will the north wind begin to blow again to-morrow? The chances are that it will, and Seward and the sending of my mail will be as far away as ever. I painted with some success, for the snow makes the cabin lighter. Really, my picture looks well. Eight canvases are far along, so that I'm proud of them. We cut wood to-day, of course. It would be great fun if only we'd more minutes of daylight to spare. Steamer must be due in Seward now. We've seen none for two weeks or longer. Monday, November 25th. It rages from the northeast. The bay is a wild expanse of breakers. They bear into our cove and thunder on the beach. A mad day and a wild night. And Seward is as far off as ever. It is now my hope that a steamer will go to Seward before me. Olson finds by his diary that none has been seen to go there for two weeks. I began two new pictures to-day trying for the first time to paint after dark. My lamp is so inadequate in this dark interior, it burns only a three-quarter inch wick, that I can work only in black and white. But I've laid in the whole picture in that way. Rockwell spends several hours a day out of doors, exploring the woods, searching out porcupine trails and caves. It is weeks since I have stopped my work even for a walk. 
In this out of doors life I see little of out of doors. It's a blessing to me to have to saw wood every day. I finished Kumaraswamy's Indian Essays today, an illuminating and inspiring book. Kumaraswamy defines mysticism as a belief in the unity of life. The creed of an artist concerns us only when we mean by it the tendency of his spirit. How hard it is to speak of these intangible things and not use words loosely and without exact meaning. I think that whatever of the mystic is in a man is essentially inseparable from him. It is his by the grace of God. After all, the qualities by which all of us become known are those of which we are ourselves least conscious. The best of me is what is quite impulsive, and looking at myself for a moment with a critic's eye, the forms that occur in my art, the gestures, the spirit of the whole of it, is in fact nothing but an exact pictorial record of my unconscious living idealism. Tuesday, November 26th. After a terribly stormy and cold night, the day was fair, with the wind comfortably settled in the north as if he meant to stay there. Only at night has it been calm. Tonight again is so, and if I had not Rockwell on my hands to make me timid, I'd go at night to Seward. Olson was a real Santa Claus today. First he gave us Schmierkäse, then a good salt salmon, two years old, which he said we'd better try and to-night a lot of butter churned by him from goat's milk. It looks like good butter, and with the added coloring matter, more palatable than the natural white butter of the goat. We felled two trees to-day, fairly small ones. We consume a vast amount of wood with our all-night fire. Well, to-morrow, let us say again, we'll be off to Seward. Wednesday, November 27th. Today, if we had known how the weather would turn, we should have started. It was lovely, cold but fair, with the wind in the southwest. It had in the morning all appearance of a heavy blow, and we failed to get in shape to take advantage of its calming as the afternoon advanced. At any rate, I have a little picture of it with the soft haze of the day and the loose clouds. I painted besides on the large canvas of Superman begun a few days ago. Olson lent me his grub box to use, a wooden box of small grocery size, with a cover fastened with a strap and buckle. Such a box is part of the outfit of every man on the Yukon. My emergency grub is now in it, my letters, Christmas presents, and all that's bound for Seward. Rockwell took Squirrely out for an airing today, wrapping him with tender care in a sweater. They went for a long way into the woods like good companions. Then Rockwell drew a portrait of his muffled pet, which is destined for Clara's Christmas. Thursday, November 28th. This continual waiting is getting upon my nerves. Most of today I spent tinkering with the engine. It goes now, in a water barrel. The trouble with the best of these little motors is that the moment they get wet they stop, and they are attached at such an exposed place on the stern that they will get wet if there's much of a sea. Then you're in a bad fix, for it's impossible to make any headway rowing with the engine, or rather the propeller, dragging. Most of the engines are hung right on the stern and can be readily detached and drawn into the boat. But mine fits into a sort of pocket built in the stern and is difficult even on land to lift out. It weighs decidedly over a hundred pounds, so I don't relish getting caught with such an equipment. I must have mentioned, by the way, that the engine was thrown in with the boat as of no value. So there's the day gone. Tonight we go to bed early, and if it is calm, just before daylight in the morning, we shall start at once. Friday, November 29th. Last night a terrific storm from the east. A few blasts struck the house with such force that it seemed our thin roof could not stand it. Of course, it is really quite strong enough, but the noise of those sudden squalls bearing along snow and ice from the treetops is simply appalling. In the morning it became milder, but continued to rain and snow, 
and for most of the day to blow heavily from the eastward. In the afternoon, to my despair, a steamer entered for Seward. She'll doubtless leave at daylight. There goes one of my chances to get my Christmas mail off. I painted splendidly to-day, and am in the seventh heaven over it, which takes away some of my gloom at never reaching Seward. A long call from Olson to-night. He sits here patiently and silently while I draw. It snows steadily. What will to-morrow bring? Francis Galton, the inquirer into human faculty, would have been charmed at Rockwell's casual mention of the colors of proper names. They do apparently assume definite colors that seem to him appropriate and characteristic beyond question. Clara, too, sees names as colors. Father is blue, mother is a darker blue. The breadth of vowel sound apparently, judging from this and other examples he gave me, lowers the tone of color. Kathleen is a light yellow, very light. Now for a bite to eat, for I've had but two meals, and then to bed. End of chapter 5「Wilderness, a Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska » by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter VI. Excursion Thursday, December 5th. November 30th we arose before daylight. It was a mild, still morning, and the melting snow dripped from the trees. Without breakfast we set about at once to carry our things over to the boat. Olson was aroused and turned out to help. There's always much to be carried on a trip to Seward. Gasoline, oil, tools, my pack bag, containing clothes, heavy blankets, and spare boots, and the grub box Olson had given me packed with mail, books, grub, and the flute. The engine was in good order and started promptly. So away we went over the bay just as the day brightened. It was calm and beautiful. The sun from below the horizon shot shafts of light up into the clouds, gray became pink, and pink grew into gold, until at last, after an hour or more, the sun's rays lighted up the mountain peaks, and we knew that he had risen. It continued calm and mild all the way, but nevertheless I caught myself singing Erlkönig, such is my anxiety at carrying Rockwell with me. Rockwell enjoyed the trip, wrapped up in a sheepskin coat of Olson's. We stopped at a fishing camp for a moment's chat from the water. The man living there had just caught a good-sized wolverine. We declined breakfast and hurried on. In Seward we stored our things in Olson's cabin, a little place about eight feet square, and started for the hotel. One of our friends met us with a shout, "'Well, you've had good sense to stay away so long!' Influenza, I then learned, had raged in Seward, there having been over three hundred and fifty cases, and smallpox had made a start. But the deaths had been few, and it was now well in hand. However, I shunned the hotel. A little cottage was generously put at our disposal, and we were soon comfortably settled there, with our mail from home spread before us. I left everything of mine at the hotel untouched and we continued to wear our old clothes throughout the stay. At midnight I went with Otto Berm to pull the dory up above the tide and overturn her, and then continued letter-writing until 3.30 a.m. December 1st and every day of our stay at Seward was calm and fair. We kept house in our cottage, I continually busy writing and doing up Christmas presents, for a steamer had entered on the 30th and was due to leave Sunday night the 1st. The people of Seward are friendly, without being the slightest bit inquisitive, and they are extremely broad-minded for all that their country is remote from the greater world. I don't believe that provincialism is an inevitable evil of far-off communities. The Alaskan is alert, enterprising, adventurous. Men stand on their own feet, and why not? The confusing intricacy of modern society is here lacking. The men's own hands take the pure gold from the rocks. No one is another's master. It's a great land, the best by far I have ever known. 
what a tell-tale of reaction from our lonely island life is this roseate vision of the little city of the far northwest we came in time to see seward quite differently and with confidence in alaska to believe it to be in no way a typical and true alaskan town the new york of the pacific as it is gloriously acclaimed in the literature of its chamber of commerce numbers its citizens perhaps at half a thousand the tenacious remnant of the many more who years ago trusted our government to fulfil its promises to really build and operate a railroad into the interior one's indignation fires at the recital of the men of seward's wrongs until you recollect that seward was built for speculation not for industry and that by the chance turn of the wheel many have merely reaped loss instead of profit there are no resources at that spot to be developed and there is consequently no industry seward is planned for growth and equipped for commerce wide avenues and numbered blocks adorn the town site maps where to the naked eye the land's a wilderness of stumps and briars the centre of the built-up portion of the town one street of two blocks length is modern with electric lights and concrete pavements the stores are wonderfully good there are two banks and several small hotels a baker from ward's bakery in new york and a french barber from the hotel buckingham there's a good grammar school a hospital and churches of all sorts there is no public library apparently one isn't badly missed seward's a tradesman's town and tradesmen's views prevail narrow reactionary thought on modern issues and a trembling concern at the menace of organized labor a strike of the three newsboys of the seward paper plunged the poor fool its printer into frantic fear of an i w w plot but even seward smiled at the little man's terror the worst of seward is itself the best is the strong men that by chance are there or that pass through from the great alaska december second was a day for shopping i bought all manner of christmas things things for the tree things to eat little presents for olson but nothing for rockwell he and i must do without presents this christmas then more letters were written a wood block that i had cut proved on my seeing a proof of it to be absolutely worthless december third i still had so much mail and business to attend to that i stayed over another day set a door frame for brownell and spent the evening at his house the postmaster came too fine fellow and we'd a great evening taking turns singing songs and the p m did mighty well with schoolmaster mr o'toole the day i'd spent writing and gossiping about town i heard then a story about olson that's worth while he was once telling a crowd of men about the reindeer to the northward among his listeners was a jew who was annoyed with his hectoring at last this joker asked olson if you bred a reindeer to a swede what would you get you'd get a jew replied olson the jew who still lives in seward has not bothered olson since the old man has a rare reputation for his honesty and truth and all-round sterling qualities it's truly a satisfaction to be in a country where men are alert enough to take no offence at alertness where enterprise is so common a virtue that it arouses no suspicion and where it is the rule to mind your own business december fourth we set about to leave for fox island it took two hours to wind up our final business in town and embark brownell helped with the boat of course the engine balked for fifteen minutes and then not of course went beautifully after travelling a quarter of a mile i learned that rockwell had left our clock standing in the snow by olson's cabin so for that we went back brownell saw us and brought it the trip was swift and smooth at kane's head it began to snow obscuring fox island but i knew the course in mid-channel the engine stopped after ten minutes tinkering it resumed going and went beautifully till we rounded the head of our cove then it sputtered and i had continually to crank it 
However, it carried us to thirty or forty feet of the shore, when it breathed its last, thanks to the snow that had by now thoroughly wet the engine and ourselves. We unloaded, and with great labor hauled up the dory and turned her over. That night I was exhausted and went straight to bed, leaving Rockwell at his drawing. So now we're on Fox Island again. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Wilderness: A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Home. Thursday, December fifth, continued. Mild, rainy, snowy, sleepy. This first day back at home. I've done little work and dared look at but one picture, that of Superman and it appears truly magnificent. The sky of it is luminous as with northern lights, and the figure lives. After all, it is life which man sees and which he tries to hold, and in his art to recreate. To that end he bends every resource, straining at what limits him. If he could only be free, free to rise beyond the limits of expression into being, at his prophetic vision of man's destiny assuming himself the lineaments of it in stature grown gigantic rearing upwards beyond the narrow clouds of earth into the unmeasured space of night his countenance glowing his arms outstretched in an embrace of wider worlds this is the spirit and the gesture of superman so i'm not unhappy now work begins again for weeks there'll be no mail in Seward, and for more weeks none here. Friday, December 6th. I'm reading a little book on Duryea. What a splendid civilization that was in the Middle Ages, with all its faults. To men with my interests, can anything be more conclusive proof of the superiority of that age to this than the position of the artist and the scholar in the community? Let me quote from Duryea's diary. Antwerp, a banquet at the Burgomaster's Hall. All their service was of silver, and they had other splendid ornaments and very costly meats. All their wives were there also, and as I was being led to the table, the company stood on both sides as if they were leading some great lord, and there were among them men of very high position who all treated me with respectful bows, and promised to do everything in their power agreeable to me that they knew of. And as I was sitting there in such grandeur, Adrian Horabu, the syndic of Antwerp, came with two servants, and presented me with four cans of wine in the name of the town councillors of Antwerp, and they had bid him say that they wished thereby to show their respect for me and assure me of their good will wherefore I returned my humble thanks, etc. After that came Master Peter, the town carpenter, and presented me with two cans of wine, with the offer of his willing services. So when we had spent a long and merry time together till late at night, they accompanied us home with lanterns in great honour. O oh, land of porcelain bathtubs! A man has only to leave all that by which we to-day estimate culture to realize that all of his own civilization goes with him right to the backwoods, and lives there with him, refined and undiminished by the hardships there. Civilization is not measured by the poverty or the wealth of the few or of the millions, nor by monarchy, republicanism, or even freedom, nor by whether we work with hands or levers but by the final fruit of all of these, that imperishable record of the human spirit, art. The obituary of today in America has surely now been written in the poor workshop of some struggling unknown man. That is all that the future will know of us. All records for winds are broken by what rages tonight. From the northwest it piles into our cove, the windows are coated with salt, and tons of flying water sail in clouds out of the bay, hiding the mountains from the base to half their height. 
our rafters bend beneath the blast ice from we know not where falls upon us with a thundering noise the canvases suspended aloft sway and flap and from end to end of the cabin the breeze rose at will it's so ridiculously bad and noisy and cold that rockwell and i just laugh but the wood is plentiful for we cut some more to-day last night at bedtime the wind had risen at some midnight hour the stove went out for i awoke at two and found the cold all about us and the wind hard at it so with a generous use of kerosene the fire was made to burn again and i returned to a good night's rest somehow one doesn't mind short exposures to the cold many a day i have stood naked out in the wind and then become at once glowing warm again in the hot cabin baked bread to-day and it turned out very well painted shivered wrote and to-night shall try to design a picture of the weird of the gods but at this moment our supper is ready and two hungry cold mortals cannot be kept from their corn mush saturday december seventh late now that we have a clock i stole one in seward we live by system our hours are regular the clock i set by the tide marking the rise of the water in the new-fallen snow we rise at seven thirty it is then not yet sunrise but fairly light breakfast is soon cooked and eaten to start the blood going hard for a good day's work we spring out of doors and chop and split and saw in the glorious icy north wind then painting begins i have scared olson away poor soul but i make it up by calling on him just at dark when my painting hours are over now it's eleven at night and i've still my bit to read Woo! but it's cold to-night and the wind is rising to a gale and last night what a bitter one i got up four times to feed the ravenous fire and even so the water pails froze we cannot afford to let it freeze much in the cabin for our stores are all exposed what if the christmas cider should freeze and burst i painted out of doors to-day in sneakers and stood it just about as long as one would imagine to love the cold is a sign of youth and we do love it the awakener sunday december eighth log cabin stuffed with moss should be wonderful in the tropics i'm about frozen on this work table i must weight my papers down to keep them from flying about the room and the wind is icy it is bitterly bitterly cold olson says we need expect no colder weather than this all winter of course we don't really mind it the stove is red hot and we may go as close to it as we please and the bed is warm except towards morning at night i move my jugs of yeast and cider toward the stove fill the air tight to the top pile blankets and wrappers upon the bed and sleep happily the gale still rages fortunately not with its utmost fury this morning rockwell and i hurried through our chores and then climbed to the low ridge of the island the snow in the woods is crusted and bore us up well so that we travelled with ease and soon reached the crest ah there it was glorious such blue and gold and rose we looked down upon the spit and saw the sea piling upon it we looked seaward and saw the snow blown from the land the spray and the mist rising in the clouds towards the sun and the sun the beautiful sun shone on us we took a number of pictures and then with numbed fingers and toes raced down the slope playing man pursued by a bear rockwell was wonderful to look at with his cheeks so red and clear he loved our little excursion and for the rest of the day we've worked i stretched and coated three large canvases hateful job painted sawed wood felled a tree which the wind carried over on to another so that there it hangs neither up nor down and that's about all it's again eleven and time for bed 
the night is beautiful even if it is terrible and the young moon is near setting monday december ninth it blows worse than ever and it is colder all day the blue sky has been hidden in clouds of vapor and flying spray the bay seethes and smokes and huge breakers race across it it is truly bitter weather olson tonight ventured the prophecy that this was about the culmination of winter but i know olson by now i cut another tree this morning to release the one of yesterday and both fell with a magnificent crash then we went to work with the crosscut saw and stocked our day's wood olson called this afternoon and related his recollection of the early days of nome a certain man he began deserted from a whaler that stopped for water on the north coast of alaska he'd been shanghaied in san francisco and was a tailor by trade he made his way down the coast with the occasional help of the esquimau at last he came to nome the men were gone from the native village but a woman took him in she was named english mary now she had heard of the gold finds in the yukon and she asked the man if he was a miner he answered yes you come with me she said and led him to a certain creek and showed him the shining nuggets lying thick upon the bottom but the tailor really knew nothing about gold and let it lie he continued down the coast and was at last carried to st michael there he met a missionary and a young fellow who had come to alaska with a party of prospectors with those two he returned in a boat to nome you'll hear different stories to be sure of how they got there but this is the right one for i've seen the boat they came in lying there off the beach well they came and saw the gold but none of them could say for certain what it was so one of them went off to get a man from the party of prospectors with whom the young fellow had come to alaska at last they got him there and he proved that it was sure enough gold they staked their claims and began to work them but word of gold travels fast and already others began to come the miner of that first party drew up mining laws for the country and these were enforced i was up on the yukon when i heard of the first find at nome i went down and arrived there in the fall a little more than a year after the strike by that time there was quite a number there some man had drawn up a plan of a town and was selling lots i bought one on the northwest corner of the block it was on the tundra tundra is vegetation covered ice soggy to a foot's depth there was a tent on my lot and some wood so i bought those too but shortly after when i came home one day from prospecting i found that both the tent and the wood had been stolen i bought lumber for the frame of a new tent it cost me thirty dollars that is fifty cents a foot by that time all kinds of people were pouring into nome they were taking out gold on the creek those that had claims at the rate of five thousand dollars in a couple of hours it was so heavy in the sand you couldn't handle a panful someone cut into my tent and cleaned me out but i had nothing much besides a jackknife i borrowed ten dollars and went to work at a dollar an hour a couple of rascals had come there a judge and a lawyer and they began to get busy swindling everybody out of their titles to claims it was said openly that if you saw anyone's claim jump it and the lawyers would make more money for you than you could get out in gold there was no use in a man without money trying to hold a claim and the crowd that was there gamblers sharps actors men and women of every kind and they did act so foolish all out of their heads over the gold the brothels were running wide open and robberies occurred in the town by daylight every man slept with his gun beside him and if he shot it was to kill the robbers chloroformed men as they slept in their tents there were thousands of people then and you could look out on the beach and see them swarming like flies everything was overturned for gold the entire beach for ten miles both ways from nome was shoveled off into the sea 
they dug under the indian village till the houses fell in and even under the graveyard and so olson's story continues a story of his life would really be as an old pioneer in seward told me a history of alaska because olson has never succeeded he has been everywhere and tried everything i have not done him justice in my abridgment of his gnome story his recollections are so intimate he remembers the words spoken in every situation and never no matter how much an adventure centers on himself does he depart in what he tells of himself from his character as i know him i would not have devoted all of the time i have to this day's entry if i had not a good day's work to my credit including the conception of a new picture so vivid that the doing of it will be mere copying it is the north wind surely after the past four days i may tell with authority of that wild prince from the north wednesday december eleventh yesterday was too gloomy a day for me to risk a page in this journal as to weather it was another fierce one cold and windy as to work accomplished nothing olson in his cabin on such a day is a treat to see i open the door and enter there he sits near the stove a black astrakhan cap on his head and the two female goats in full possession of the cabin nanny the milk goat is a most affectionate creature she lays her head on olson's lap and as he scratches her head her eyes close in blissful content see her pretty little face says olson and her lovely lips he's certainly the kindest creature to animals and to human ones too we have good reason to know today it is milder the vapor is thick on the bay but it lies low upon the water and the magnificent mountains sparkle in the sunlight work has gone better for me and it has been a day not without accomplishment i baked bread beautiful bread cut wood helped olson a bit and had a glorious rough house with my son he's a great fighter i train him for the fights he's bound to have some day by letting him attack me with all his strength and that has come to be not a little thing friday december thirteenth in the midst of letter writing i stop to note down a dramatic cloud effect that's the way the day's work goes if i'm out of doors busy with a saw or axe i jump at once to my paints when an idea comes it's a fine life and more and more i realize that for me at least such isolation not from my friends but from the unfriendly world is the only right life for me my energy is too unrestrained to have offered to it the bait for fight and play that the city holds out without its being spent in absolutely profitless and trivial enterprises and here what a haven of peace almost the last touch is added to its perfection by the sweet nature of the old man olson i have never known such a man i'm no admirer of the picturesqueness of rustic character seen close to it's generally damnably stupid and coarse i have seen the working class from near at hand and without illusion but olson he has such tact and understanding such kindness and courtesy as put him outside of all classes where true men belong to-night it looked like the picture i have drawn these are beautiful days yesterday it was as calm in our little cove as one would look for on a summer's day the day was blue and mild a day for work i made of my north wind the most beautiful picture that ever was i stood it facing outwards in the doorway and from far off it still showed as vivid more vivid and brilliant than nature itself it's the first time i've taken my pictures into the broad light that's where they should be seen last night was calm until four o'clock in the morning then the wind again struck in and the trees roared and the roof creaked and groaned to-day it was calmer we began by felling a tall spruce more than two feet in diameter it lies now near the cabin a great screen of evergreen 
its wood should last us many weeks i painted out of doors on two pictures that's bitterly cold work to crouch down in the snow through bent knees the blood goes slowly feet are numbed fingers stiffen but then the warm cabin is near this minute i've returned from splitting wood out in the moonlight on days when painting goes with spirit the chores are left undone if only it were possible to put down faithfully all of olson's stories last night he told of his return to san francisco from the yukon thirty years ago how the little band of weather-beaten crippled miners appeared on their return to civilization olson was on crutches from scurvy his beard and hair were of a year's growth all were in their working clothes all bearded brown free-spirited and their wealth they carried on them in bags gold some to seven thousand dollars worth as olson tells it you yourself live in that day you hear the german landlady of the chicago hotel in san francisco a motherly woman who put all the grub on the table at once so you could help yourself say you boys have some of you been in alaska for years and i know about how you've lived now that you're back you must have a hankering for some things tell me whatever you want and i'll get it for you and up spoke one big fellow i remember how my mother used to have cabbage i want you to get me one big head and cook it and let me have it all to myself that night they went to the music halls in their miners clothes all as they were and drank gallons of beer and from the boxes and the balconies the girls all clamoured to be asked to join them who were such free spenders two days later they were paid in coin for their gold by the mint and all went to the tailors and got them fine suits of clothes and so it continues and he told of custer's massacre and to-night of the sagacity of horses in leading a trapper back to the traps he'd set and maybe lost when a horse swims with you across a stream guide him with your hand on his neck but pull not ever so little on the line or he'll rear backwards in the water and likely drown himself and you saturday december fourteenth a pretty useless day no work accomplished but the daily chores what is there to say of such a day olson brought over his letter to kathleen tonight and read it to us it's just like him to be really himself even at letter writing the letter is full of nice humor she'll think what kind of an old fool is that he said but what do i care i'll just say whatever i feel like saying and he always does in a mild way he lives blake's proverb always speak the truth and base men will avoid you some people have found olson very rough and ill-mannered made bread tonight and stamped about seventy-five envelopes with my device tonight it is mild and overcast a light snow has begun to fall so far this winter the fall of snow has been extremely light it should bank up almost to the cabin's eaves ah my bed awaits me good night sunday december fifteenth this is another day that is hardly worth recording one that would not be missed from a life it's time something were again said about young rockwell who is the real live crowning beauty of the community weeks have passed since i last recorded his fresh delight in everything here it is the same to-day for hours he plays alone out of doors now he's an animal crawling on all fours along the trunk of a tree that i have felled going out upon its horizontal branches as the porcupines do hiding himself in the foliage and growling fiercely hours long it seems while the foolish goats flee in terror and the foxes race wildly up and down the extent of their corral again he's a browsing creature eating the spruce needles with decided relish doing it so seriously truly he lives the part he plays when it is one of his beloved wild creatures then he tears up and down the beach mounted like a four-year-old kid on a stick horse 
yelling as loud as he can, going to the water's edge and racing the swell as it mounts the slope. And presently I capture him for his end of the saw. At that he no longer knows fatigue. He's as good as a man. He really never tires, and the work goes on with a fine, jolly good will that makes of the hardest chore one of the day's pleasures. Rockwell is lonely at times, but if he tells me he'd like somebody to play with, he's sure to add in the same breath, Ah, well, never mind. I don't know how such a haphazard education, if continued, would fit him for participation in the practical affairs of life. But I am convinced that if all the little beauties of spirit that can now be seen budding could be allowed free, clean growth, quite away from the brutal hand of mass influences, we'd have nothing less than the full and perfect flowering of a human soul, and in our reachings toward supermanhood none can do more. Here, as an example, is an achievement of his imagination that it is hard to picture as surviving long in the atmosphere of a large school. Rockwell for two or three years has called himself the mother of all things. It is not a figure of speech with him, but an attitude towards life. If it were the creed of a great poet, and it could be, the discerning critic might discover it to be of the profoundest significance in modern thought. In little Rockwell it is of one piece with his whole spirit which expresses itself in his love for all animals, the fiercest to the mildest, and for all growing things. The least manifestation of that which is thought to be typical cruelty of boys outrages his whole nature. I am far from believing Rockwell to be a unique example of childhood. I think that while cruelty appears uppermost where boys herd together, the love of animals is no less characteristic of many sensitive children. But of this I am certain that nothing will make a child more ridiculous in the eyes of the mob child than this most perfect and most beautiful attitude of some children toward life. In considering the education of a child, and weighing what is to be gained or lost by one system or another, I am inclined to think that no gain can outweigh the loss to a child of its loving, non-predatory impulses. Tuesday, December 17th. Once a miner died, and presently found his way to the gates of heaven. What do you want? said St. Peter. To come in, of course. What sort of man are you? I'm a miner. Well, said St. Peter, we've never had any one of that kind here before, so I suppose you might as well come in. But the miner, once within the gates, fell to tearing up the golden streets of heaven, digging ditches and tunnels all over the place, and making a frightful mess of it all. At last a second miner presented himself at the gates. "'Not on your life,' said St. Peter. "'We have one miner here, and we only wish we knew some way to get rid of him. He's tearing up the whole place.' "'Only let me in,' said the second miner, "'and I'll promise to get rid of that fellow for you.' So St. Peter admitted him. This second miner easily found the other, who was hard at work amid a shower of flying earth. Going up to him, he cried in an undertone, "'Partner! They struck gold in hell!' The miner dropped his work and sprang toward the gates. "'Peter! Peter! Open! Open! Let me out of heaven! I'm off to hell!' What a book of yarns and jokes this is becoming! Today work went a little better, and the weather a little worse. It pours. For the end of December it is wonderfully mild, but then I expect little really cold weather here. Tonight it is full moon. The tide is at its highest for the year, and the southeast wind piles the water up till it reaches and overflows the land. Olson expects it to touch his house tonight if the wind continues. Tree trunks, uprooted somewhere from the soil, monstrous and grotesque, grind along our beach. The water is full of driftwood and wreckage. Wednesday, December 18th. There's a little bucket of dough that stands forever on the shelf behind the stove. 
sourdough is made with yeast flour and water to the consistency of a bread sponge and then allowed to stand indefinitely for all that you take out you add more flour and water so that what's left in the bucket and that shortly is as fit for use as the original mixture alaskans use it extensively as the basis for bread and hot cakes you add but a pinch of soda and a little water to the proper consistency and it's all ready for use the old-time alaskans rejoice in the honorable title of sourdoughs olson's cabin in seward stands comfortably on a little lot in a quite thickly settled part of the town i wondered at his affluence in possessing a house and lot here is its history as he told it to me to-night when olson first came to seward he built or he bought already built a little cabin standing on a part of the beach now occupied by the railroad yard in course of time he went to valdez for a winter's work returning he found no cabin it was gone from that spot and he has not found it since but corporations and governments are nothing to olson when he feels himself injured he went to one official and said see here winter's at hand and i have no house what are you going to do about it well they would see what could be done and in time referred him to a higher authority i want a cabin olson said to this one if you don't give me the lumber to build one with i'll have to steal it from you i have no money and no cabin winter is here and i'm certainly going to live in a cabin this winter so they gave him an old shed to tear down and use but told him not to build on the beach the town of seward was laid off in lots by the stakes olson could tell a lot from a street and fair and square on a lot somebody's lot he put his cabin the owner of the land was tolerant and let it stay there a few years but one day he ordered olson's house taken off so olson carried it somehow out into the middle of the street where it fitted in nicely among the tree stumps well and good for a little time till in the summer before last the town of seward improved that street and sent a man and team to remove the stumps if you're paid to remove the stumps you may as well move my house for me said olson where to asked the man you can suit yourself said olson so the cabin was again planted on a desirable lot of somebody's and there it stands to-day neat and trim with a little wooden walk connecting its doorway with the plank sidewalk of the street alaska is to be sure a great free country to-day has been wonderfully mild and comfortable from time to time the rain has fallen gently over the water the clouds have drooped hiding the mountain peaks the sea has been glassy save for the long swell and this more to be heard upon the beach than seen rockwell and i at dusk walked the shore out to the point between the coves we saw the glowing sky where the sun had set the mountainous islands to the southward and our own cove and its mountain ramparts beautiful in the black and white of the spruces and the snow if i but had my prepared canvas i'd make large studies of the many views from this point rockwell at dinner begged me repeatedly to have part of his junket besides my own i wondered at it for although he is always considerate and polite this was almost too much and in other ways i noticed his alacrity to be obliging later in the day he told me after much embarrassment that he had made up his mind to be nicer about everything and to do more for me and yet i had previously found no fault with him how could i so ends a day and again i think that in this country i would gladly live for years End of chapter seven Chapter 8 of Wilderness, A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Christmas 
thursday december nineteenth this day is never to be forgotten so beautiful so calm so still with the earth and every branch and tree muffled in deep feathery new-fallen snow and all day the softest clouds have drifted lazily over the heaven shrouding the land here and there in veils of falling snow while elsewhere or through the snow itself the sun shone golden shadows dazzling peaks fairy tracery of branches against the blue summer sea it was a day to live and work could be forgotten so rockwell and i explored the woods at first reverently treading one path that the snow about us might still lie undisturbed but soon the cub in the boy broke out and he rolled in the deepest thickets shook the trees down upon himself lay still in the snow for me to cover him completely washed his face till it was crimson and wound up with a naked snow bath i photographed him standing thus in the deep snow at the water's edge with the mountains far off behind him then he dried himself at the roaring fire we'd made ready and felt like a new boy if that can be imagined we both sketched out of doors for a little while in the morning like young lady amateurs i tried it again two or three times throughout the day with indifferent results it was too beautiful we cut wood too and that went with a zest while rockwell dried himself after his bath i searched in the woods for a christmas tree and cut a fair-sized one at last for its top christmas is right upon us now to-night the cranberries stew on the stove friday december twentieth the beautiful snow is fast going under the falling rain with only five more days before christmas it is probable we'll have little if any snow on the ground then a snowless christmas in alaska this day was as uneventful as could be part of the morning was consumed in putting a new handle into the sledge-hammer it was too dark to paint long really hardly an hour of daylight these days slip by so easily and with so little accomplished only by burning midnight oil can much be done sunday december twenty second both yesterday and today it has poured rain they've not been unpleasant days however occasional let-ups have allowed us to cut wood and get water without inconvenience this morning olson fearing that a continuance of the mild weather would melt the ice in the lake and send his bags of fish to the bottom went out to the centre of the lake where they hung suspended through a hole in the ice and brought them in but so precarious has the ice become that he carried a rope and took me along in case of trouble to get out upon the ice we had to go some distance along the lake's shore returning we missed meeting rockwell who had gone to join us not for some time did it occur to me to call him it was well i did call the poor boy on not seeing us had suddenly concluded we were drowned a strip of water separated him from the ice he was on the point of wading into this at the moment i called him he was still terribly excited when he reached us both days i have been occupied with humble housewifely duties baking washing mending and now the cabin is adorned with our drying clothes here where water must be carried so far it is the wet days that are wash days darning is a wretched nuisance we should have socks enough to tide us over our stay here last night after rockwell had been put to bed i sat down and did two of the best drawings i have made at half past twelve i finished them and then to calm my elation a bit for sleep read in the odyssey at this my second reading of the book it's as intensely interesting or more so than before as a story it is incomparably better than the iliad to me it is full of suggestions for wonderful pictures ten days from now it comes due for olson to go to seward if only then we have mild calm weather but as yet we have seen no steamer go to seward since early in the month it looks as if the steamship companies had combined to deprive alaska of its christmas mail and freight in a policy of making the deadlock with the government over the mail contracts 
intolerable. Meanwhile, instead of serving us, the jaunty little naval cruisers that summered here in idleness doubtless loaf away the winter months in comfortable southern ports. Monday, December 23rd. Up to this morning the hard warm rain continued, and now the stars are all out and it might be thought a night in spring. At 8.30 I walked over in sneakers and underwear for a moment's call on Olson, but he had gone to bed and now although we'll have no snow the weather is fair for christmas if olson believes as he says that christmas will pass as any other day he is quite wrong the tree waits to be set up and it will surely be a thing of beauty blazing with as many candles in this sombre log interior i've given up the idea of dressing olson as santa claus in goat's wool whiskers santa claus without presents would move us to tears there are a few little gifts a pocket knife and a kitchen set of knife fork and can opener for olson an old broken fountain pen for rockwell some sticks of candy and the dinner what shall it be wait it is midnight i've just finished a good drawing the lamp is about at its accustomed low mark yesterday it had to be filled twice those nights when without a clock i sat up so late and to so uncertain an hour i have discovered by the lamp and clock together to have been really long my bedtime then was after two or three o'clock but i arose later today i finished a little picture for olson and so did rockwell these were forgotten in my list of presents as i've just written it I have shown in my picture the king of the island himself striding out to feed the goats, while Billy, rearing on his hind legs, tries to steal the food on the way. Rockwell's picture is of Olson surrounded by all the goats in a more peaceful mood. Olson's cabin is in the background. I wish we had more to give the good old man. At any rate, he dines with us. Christmas Eve We've cleaned house, stowed everything away upon shelves and hooks and in corners, moved even my easel aside. Decorated the roof timbers with dense hemlock boughs, stowed quantities of wood behind the stove, for there must be no work on that holiday, and now both Rockwell and I are in a state of suppressed excitement over tomorrow. What a strange thing! Nothing is coming to us no change in any respect in the routine of our lives but what we make ourselves, and yet the day looms so large and magnificent before us. I suppose the greatest festivals of our lives are those at which we dance ourselves. You need nothing from outside, not even illusion. Certainly children need to be given scarcely an idea to develop out of it an atmosphere of mystery and expectation as real and thrilling to themselves as if it rested upon true belief. Well, the tree is ready, cut to length with a cross at the foot to stand upon, and a cardboard and tinfoil star to hang at its top. And now, as to Christmas weather, this morning, as might just as well have been expected, was again overcast. Toward evening, light snow began to fall. It soon turned to rain, and the rain now has settled down to a gentle, even, all-night-and-day pace. Let it snow or rain, and grow dark at midday. The better shall be our good Christmas cheer within. This is the true Christmas land. The day should be dark the house further overshadowed by the woods tall and black and there in the midst of that sombre dreadful gloom the christmas tree should blaze in glory unrivalled by moon or sun or star christmas day on fox island it is mild the ground is almost bare and a warm rain falls First the Christmas tree, all dripping wet, is brought into the house and set upon its feet. It is nine feet and a half high, and just touches the peak of the cabin. There it stands, and dries its leaves while Rockwell and I prepare the feast. Both stoves are kept burning, and the open door lets in the cool air. Everything goes beautifully. The wood burns as it should, the oven heats, the kettle boils, 
the beans stew the bread browns in the oven just right and the new pudding sauce foams up as rich and delicious as if instead of the first it were the hundredth time i've made it and now everything is ready the clock stands at a quarter to three night has about fallen and lamplight is in the cabin run rockwell out of doors and play a while quickly i stow the presents about the tree hang sticks of candy from it and light the candles rockwell runs for mr olson and just as they approach the cabin the door opens and fairyland is revealed to them it is wonderful the interior of the cabin is illuminated as never before as perhaps no cabin interior ever was among these wild mountains then all amazed and wondering those two children come in who knows which is the more entranced then olson and i drink in deep solemnity a silent toast and the old man says i'd give everything yes everything i have in the world to have your wife here now and the presents are handed out for olson this picture from rockwell ah he thinks it's wonderful then for rockwell this book a surprise from seward next for olson a painting a kitchen set and a pocket knife by this time he's quite overcome it's the first christmas he has ever had and rockwell when he is handed two old copies of the geographic magazine cries in amazement why i thought i was to have no presents but he gets besides a pocket knife and the broken fountain pen and sits on the bed looking at the things as if they were the most wonderful of gifts dinner is now set upon the table olson adjusts his glasses and reads the formal menu that lies at his place so we feast and have a jolly good time menu fox island christmas nineteen eighteen hors d'oeuvres olives pickles entrees spaghetti a la fox island roti beans a la resurrection bay murphy's on casserole cranberry sauce dessert plum pudding magnifique sauce a la alaska rum demitasse nuts raisins bonbons home sweet home cider music by the german band it is a true party and looks like one rockwell and i are in clean white shirts olson is magnificent in a new flannel shirt and his sunday trousers and waistcoat he wears a silk tie and in it a gold nugget pin he is shaven and clipped about the ears how grand he looks the food is good and plentiful the night is long only the christmas candles are short-lived and we extinguish them to save them for another time finally as the night deepens olson leaves us amid mutual expressions of delight in each other's friendship and rockwell and i tumble into bed the next day and the next it is mild resting the weather seems to be at this peaceful holiday season we cut no wood and do little work we write long letters both of us and consume at mealtime the food left over from christmas i read the odyssey great story just now i am past that magnificent slaughter of the wooers else these delayed pages would still be unwritten a few more odysseys to read here in this wild place and one could forget the modern world and return in manners and speech and thought to the heroic age that would be an adventure worth trying maybe we are not so deeply permeated with the culture of today that we could not throw it off surely the spirit of the heroes strikes home to our hearts as we read of them in the ancient books saturday december twenty eighth for the first time in days the sun has risen in a clear sky and shone upon the mountains across from us it is colder for ice has formed again on the tub of water out of doors but there is a little wind i am writing in preparation for olson's trip he too is making ready food for the foxes is on the stove for many days feeding his engine gets a little burnishing it's no insignificant voyage to seward in the winter 
if only it holds out fair and calm until a steamer comes. There's the hitch now. We have seen none go to Seward since the first of the month. Tomorrow, probably, the Christmas tree must come down. The hemlock trimmings shed all over the cabin till today I tore them out. Last night we had our final lighting of the tree. Rockwell and I stood out of doors and looked in at it. What a marvelous sight in the wilderness! If only some hapless castaways had strayed in upon us, lured by that light. We sang Christmas carols out there in the dark, did a Christmas dance on the shore, and then came in, and while the tree still burned, told each other stories. Rockwell's story was about the adventures of some children in the woods, full of thrilling climaxes. It came by the yard. I told him of an Indian boy who, longing for Christmas, went out into the dark woods at night and closed his eyes, and how behind his closed eyes he found a world rich in everything the other lacked. There was his Christmas tree, and to it came the wild animals. They got each a present the mother porcupine a box of little silken balls to stick on to her quills for decoration, and the father porcupine a toothbrush because his large teeth were so very yellow. After the story it was bedtime. Well, this fair day has ended, and with the night have come clouds and a cold gloom foreboding snow. But I have learned to expect nothing of the weather but what it gives us. Sunday, December twenty ninth. Squirrely's birthday party. Squirrely is seated in a condensed milk box. At his back hangs a brown sweater. About him stand his presents, consisting chiefly of feathers. The table is spread with the feast in shells, and the whole is brilliantly illuminated by a Christmas tree candle. Long life to Squirrely, and may he never fall to pieces nor be devoured by moths. Monday, December 30th. Yesterday it rained gently, today it pours. I sit here with the door open and the stove slumbering. Such weather in this country that the world believes to be an iceberg. But in Seward and on the mountains, no doubt, it is snowing enough. Today I made so good a drawing that I'm sitting up as if the flight of time and the coming of morning were no concern of mine. It is half past twelve. New Year's Eve, Tuesday. This is the tenth anniversary of Rockwell's parents, and I have kept it as well as I could, working all day upon a drawing for his mother, and to-night holding a kind of song service with Rockwell. Rockwell, who at nine years has every reason to celebrate to-day, however he may feel at twenty-nine, has written his mother a sweet little letter. I'm terribly homesick to-night, and don't know what to say about it in these genial pages. It has been a solemn day. When Olson was here tonight, I began from playing the flute to sing. He was delighted, and I continued. What a strange performance here in the wilderness, a little boy, an old man, listening as I sing loudly and solemnly to them without accompaniment. Olson brought us a pan of goat's milk today, as he often does. I make junket of it, and it is a truly delicious dish, ever so much better than when made of cow's milk. It resembles a jelly of pure cream. It has rained hard most of the day. At times a mist has hung in a band halfway up the mountain's height across the bay. It is a remarkable sight. Tonight is as warm as any night in spring or autumn. It thaws continually, and even the ice that once covered the ground beneath the snow is fast disappearing. The year goes out without a steamer having been seen to come with the Christmas mail. It is close to midnight. I have one secret resolution to make for the new year, and that I may make it as earnestly and as truly as possible, the stars and the black sky shall be my witness and so with the year nineteen hundred and eighteen i end this page end of chapter eight